Welcome, welcome to worship at Blacksburg Presbyterian Church. Whether you're here in the pews or worshiping with us online now or later in the week, we're so glad that you took time to stop and pause and listen for what the Spirit is saying in your life and in the life of the world. Every week we remind people that everyone is welcome here. And what we mean by that is that each of you, in your beautiful, God-given, human particularity, are affirmed and celebrated and included in every aspect of the life of this church. Whoever you are, no matter where you've come from, no matter your story, no matter where you find yourself on this life of faith, you belong. Your presence here makes our community even more vibrant. We hope you'll check out some of the opportunities for faith and service that are listed in your bulletin. And Sarah Wines also has a few announcements about our life together. Yes, thanks. Good morning. As usual, I'd like to remind you to sign the friendship pads that you find at the end of the pews. Pass them down. Several things to take note of. Next Sunday, February 18th after worship, is our annual congregational meeting. Annual reports, which look like this, are available today. And you can find in them in, uh, short reports, a bunch of short reports, about all the work of 2023 and the budget for next year and Pastor Sarah's terms of call. And receiving those reports and voting on the terms of call are the agenda for the congregational meeting. Um, you can find these on the table in the narthex. You can also find there um, resources for observing Lent at home. A guide like this for grown-ups, a set of cards like this for all ages, and gra gratitude calendars which go with our fish boxes, if these look familiar to you. So take a look on that table out there in the narthex. Um, Ash Wednesday is this Wednesday. That's when Lent begins. And you're invited here um, that day, Wednesday, for an Ash Wednesday service at 6.30 here in the sanctuary to observe Ash Wednesday. And there will be no child care. So look at, for all those things in your bulletin. And check the coat rack area and the table today that's over near the elevators to see if you have any belongings that are in lost and found. A lot of items have been left behind over the past few months, and in case any of them are yours, go claim them, because after a few weeks, they'll be taken to the thrift shop. Um, also note that the Sunday discussion group on Jesus and the Gospels that was originally scheduled to start this evening will not begin until February 25th, so take note of that. Um, and Sarah Wiles will be on vacation this week. Thank you to Emily Rhodes Hunter, our parish associate, Again, for being available for pastoral care. And thank you to Jen Brothers for giving our sermon today. Jen is the church ministry specialist for Presbytery of the Peaks, and you can learn more about her in your bulletin. Now I would like to call on Natalie Green and Clara Coral. What's your favorite Super Bowl food? Mine is wings. I like nachos. Well, up to 100 million people will be eating and watching football tonight, or maybe just the commercials. 44 million Americans won't have enough to eat. That includes one in five children. Back in 1990, a Presbyterian youth group in South Carolina decided to do something to help. So the Super Bowl of Caring was created. That's spelled S-O-U-P-E-R. 34 years later, almost 200 million in money and food have been donated all across the country to support local food programs. You can help by donating at the Give tab on the BPC website or by placing cash or a specially marked check along with today's offering when our youth group passes soup pots. All Super Bowl donations will go to the Blacksburg Interfaith Food Pantry. Thank, Thank you, you for, for your support. support. Thank you. And I invite all of you to join us after worship in the gathering space or fellowship, fellowship and refreshments. And now I invite you to center, our, center yourself as we begin our worship together.
I invite you to rise in body or in spirit as we call ourselves to worship. Grace and peace be with you, and also with you. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. We are here to remember and proclaim the good news that Jesus brought, the affirmation of the value of every human life, the gospel that confronts us with our own sin, slowing our rush to judgment, the spirit that soars with freedom and forgiveness. Come, friends, let us remember, rejoice, and recommit ourselves to the way of Jesus. Beloved, none of us is perfect. There's no shame in that. And there is nothing in your life or in this world that is so broken that God cannot make it whole. So let's be honest together about our need for healing. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, our brokenness is too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open us to a future in which we can be changed. 
and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Whenever we feel that impulse to shame or to accuse or to condemn or to pile on the criticism, grace invites us to pause, to soften, to see ourselves and the world around us through the lens of mercy. Friends, here. And trust the good news. By grace, our sins are forgiven. forgiven and restored people, I invite you to exchange signs of peace with one another, and as you're doing so, I invite the children to come forward. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Good. Um, this morning I want to talk about rules. What are some rules that you have at school or at home? Yes. Oh, okay. They, at lunch, at school, they have red cups, yellow cups, and green cups. Sounds like red cups mean you're not allowed to talk. So that's probably, that's a rule for keeping the sound down. What are some other rules? Yes. Um, my rule is not able to jump on the couch No jumping on the couch or bed. Good. Yes. No running in the hall at school. Yes. You're not allowed to leave your, your clothes on the floor at home. Those are all good rules. Those, um, okay. So, um, do you know, God has some rules for us too. Have you ever heard of the Ten Commandments? Do you remember? Those were some of the rules that God um, gave us to help us love God better and to get along with one another better. Um, do you remember any of them? What's one? Any of them? Yes. Don't lie. Don't lie. Very good. Any, any others? What else do you remember? Yeah? Don't worship any other gods. Very good. Yeah. So like, yes? Clean up. Clean up. Yep. Yeah. So <laughs> these are good rules to live by. Yes. Um, 
Don't play outside if it's raining hard, because you want to stay healthy. OK, well, so there's lots of good rules. Um, have, now tell me, let's be honest, have any of you ever broken a rule? I know I've broken rules, right? So what happened when you broke a rule? What was, was there a consequence? I have not broken a single rule. You've never yeah. broken a single rule. <laughs> um, what, what kinds of consequences could happen if you break a rule? Yes? Um, you, you lose your switch. You might lose uh, access to one of your toys or something you want to do, yes. You might not be able to use your tablet. So um, are there times when that um, punishment it happens in front of everybody else, or is it always private? Like, has a teacher ever called you out for talking in class in front of everybody? Or did that, yeah. Or, or sometimes they might say something just to you. It's embarrassing, isn't it, when you get called in front of everybody? Nope, no, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, well, our Bible story today, um, there is a woman and she broke a rule and she got caught and she was brought out in front of a whole bunch of important lawyers and church leaders. And the leaders wanted to punish her in front of everyone. But Jesus was there too. And Jesus had compassion on her. That means that Jesus loved her and he cared about her even though she broke a rule. Jesus asked the leaders if any of them had ever broken a rule. He said anyone who was perfect was allowed to punish the woman. So what do you think happened? Nobody punished the woman. <laughs> Nobody punished the woman. That's right. So one, the leaders knew that they had broken rules too, and so one by one they walked away. And Jesus was left alone with the woman. And he told her that he still loved her, and that he forgave her, and he was not going to punish her. He told her to go and don't sin or break rules anymore. And that's good news. That's good news for us, because it means that Jesus will love and forgive us too. Let's pray. Can you repeat after me? Loving God, thank you for giving us rules to help us get along together. Thank you for forgiving us and loving us, even when we break rules. Amen. Now, I have some pebbles here that have some different Bible verses on them, um, and they, they might help you remember, think about ways to get along with God. You can each take one. Just, to, just take one, whichever one. Let's grab one. As we turn now to our scripture reading, let us go before God in prayer. Send your spirit, O oh God, to search us and teach us. Help us to understand the wisdom of your way. Give us the mind of Christ, by whose gracious word we live. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 8, starting in verse 1. And Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he returned to the temple. All the people gathered around him, and he sat down and taught them. The legal experts and Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. Placing her in the center of the group, they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery. 
In the law, Moses commanded us to stone women like this. What do you say? They said this to test him because they wanted a reason to bring an accusation against him. Jesus bent down and wrote on the ground with his finger. They continued to question him, so he stood up and replied, whoever hasn't sinned should throw the first stone. Bending down again, he wrote on the ground. Those who heard him went away, one by one, beginning with the elders. Finally, only Jesus and the woman were left in the middle of the crowd. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Is there no one to condemn you? She said, No one, sir. Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, don't sin anymore. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God in us, and for the word of God among us. Thanks be to God. I love preaching on texts that include women, since they are few and far between. And if I were stranded on a desert island with only one gospel that I could choose, I would want it to be the gospel according to John. So when I was asked if I wanted to continue with the sermon series based on Francis Taylor Gensch's book, Encounters with Jesus, I didn't hesitate to say yes. John chapter 8, the woman accused of adultery, sign me up. But I should have known better. As is so often the case, the more I dug into the story and the more commentaries that I read, the less I could see straight. I mean, I love hearing Jesus tell this woman that he doesn't condemn her. But that last line, go and sin no more, it sounds impossible and unfair. The men who were invited to reflect upon their sin, they walk away without this admonition to go and sin no more. So it has been argued that one reading of this story perpetuates the patriarchal practices that it intends to disrupt. This is truly a tricky story with a bit of wonky history that might also have suffered from the patriarchal practices that it exposes. What do I mean by this? Well, the earliest and the best Greek manuscripts of John don't contain this story. And by the time it does show up in later manuscripts, it moves around. Sometimes it appears in other sections of John. Sometimes it even shows up in the Gospel according to Luke. What is going on here? One way that scholars have tried to explain its roving history is by suggesting that it actually might not be a story original to John or to Luke. It might actually be an independent piece of Jesus tradition rooted in the earliest orally transmitted stories. It's also been suggested that this story might be missing from early manuscripts because it contradicted the early church's more punitive response to adultery. The freedom that Jesus offers her, his lack of condemnation was embarrassing, dangerous even. And this explanation sounds plausible to me, as many a church father and theologian have gone on record to argue that just because Jesus doesn't condemn the woman, it doesn't mean she shouldn't be punished. Case in point, Reformation theologian and Presbyterian church father John Calvin preached, quote, those who deduce from this story that adultery should not be punished by death must, on the same reasoning, admit that inheritances should not be divided, since Christ 
refused to arbitrate between two brothers. Indeed, even crime will be exempt from the penalties of law if the punishment of adultery is remitted, for the door will then be thrown open to every kind of treachery." Unquote. Calvin's words reveal the threat that the text posed then and continues to pose to the social order. Let sexual sin go unpunished and everything else will fall apart. So I'm grateful for the mouths and the ears and the hearts that weren't afraid to transcribe this hot potato of a story, no matter where they put it. And I especially love that this story found a home here in the Gospel of John, where Christ embodies the true light that enlightens everyone, the light that the darkness cannot overcome. So let's turn to the story itself to find its light for today. The setting is the temple, not inside, but outside. It's morning. Jesus' followers have gathered. They are there to learn from him. Responding to their eagerness, he sits down like rabbis did to teach. But he's interrupted by a group of men. They've brought a woman with them, presumably against her will. They place her in the center. She has no name and no ally, but now all eyes are on her. She's been bad, they say. Adultery. The law commands us to stone her. What do you say? Now the law of the day did indeed support the death penalty, but it didn't mention stoning, so I'm not quite sure why they went there. One thing, though, that's missing is that punishment was prescribed for both the man and the woman according to the law, but her partner's absent. Why is he missing if, he's, if she was caught in the very act? I mean, maybe he ran away, or maybe he was a Roman soldier and therefore beyond their reach. It's also possible the whole thing was made up. The narrator says that what the men were really after was the opportunity to accuse Jesus of being wrong. Now, it is possible that that comment, that line in the story, isn't original to it either. There has been some scholarship around that idea. Either way, it's important to note that comments such as those and there are many of them in John's Gospel. Comments that ascribe this ulterior motive to the religious establishment, they have contributed to anti-Judaic prejudices that we need to learn to leave behind. The Pharisees and the legal experts, they were protecting the values of their institutions. They didn't understand what Jesus was up to and they judged his teachings and his actions as threatening. And we do this sort of thing all the time. So whether they approached him with a real question or a trap, the thing is, Jesus, he didn't engage with them. He bent toward the ground to write something with his finger, so now all eyes are no longer on the woman, and the men, they have a chance to let it go. They can walk away. They can change their minds. But we're not very good at letting go when we feel threatened, when we feel like we're losing control. We like to hold on tighter to our judgments because there's safety in certainty. Although the truth is, that safety comes from living inside a cage. Like that line that you have in the bulletin, out beyond ideas of wrong and right, there's a field. I'll meet you there. That's where freedom lies. But the men, they're not looking for freedom. 
Jesus has threatened the social and religious order that gave them their sense of power. And he's going to continue to threaten their certainty that they can use this woman as an object. I love this cool, calm, collected portrait of Jesus. He's not budging. He knows who he is. The word of God made flesh is at home and at one with God and with humans. When I imagine his centeredness, his at oneness and at homeness with God and all of creation, I actually feel for these men. They're attempting to protect themselves and their power in the only way they know how. And I get that. I've done that. They don't know what they don't know. The privilege of having privilege, as they say, is not knowing your privilege. None of us can see everything or know everything. And we can't be right all of the time. We are products of all sorts of influences. We've learned patterns of behavior, and we've absorbed values that harm others and imprison us, just like these men. And to their credit, when Jesus offered them the opportunity to look at themselves, it appears that they realized that a system ruled by judgment and condemnation wasn't good for them either. So when the scales fell from their eyes, that's when they were free to go away, to walk away from judgment and condemnation, and to align with God's ways. The implications of this story are tremendous when we draw it into our context. I know you know we can't avoid swimming in racist, sexist, classist, ableist, heterosexist, et cetera, et cetera, waters that influence us to privilege one idea, one value, one group over another. But God's realm doesn't operate like that. Because in God's realm, everyone matters equally. Everyone is worthy of dignity, autonomy, and grace. And that's the world that God calls us to long for, to envision, and to manifest. Just like he did for the people in this story, Christ invites us to examine our inherited values, our rules, and our behaviors without fear or condemnation. And when those scales fall off, we can let go of what is keeping us and keeping others from thriving. Judgment and condemnation, those are tools of enslavement. They don't belong in God's realm. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Freed people, free others. Our Christian tradition has sadly gotten this wrong often. Our collective complicity with systemic oppression is dispiriting. All too often, the religious establishment has absorbed and embodied the ways of the world that keep everyone from equally thriving. But let's not confuse Christ with religion, because just as Jesus disrupted systems that gave one group or power or, or control over another, the cosmic Christ continues to invite us into this work. Like the men in today's story, for us, it begins by letting go of the judgments and condemnations that keep us and others from thriving. We can do this work because we're not left alone to do it. Christ at homeness and at, one with, at oneness with God is freely shared with all of us. This is a gift we cannot earn. Just accept. 
I've been digging into Celtic Christianity recently to prepare for a pilgrimage to the island of Iona and its abbey. At the heart of Celtic Christianity is the belief that the light and life of Christ runs through all of creation. Therefore, everyone and everything is sacred. Sin, yes, it exists, but not because we're born bad. It exists, according to Celtic Christianity, because we suffer from soul forgetfulness. Celtic teacher and author John Philip Newell writes that Celtic Christianity is at its core the conviction that we essentially need to keep listening to what the soul already knows. Now, in times past, this belief has been judged and condemned as a heresy by the religious establishment. But as I think about it, it looks to me like what Jesus is doing when he approaches the Pharisees and the legal experts. Underneath his invitation for them to examine their own hearts, I hear him saying, listen to what your soul already knows. Nobody lives a perfect life. Do you want to be judged according to the standards with which you judge others? That way leads to death. Loving others as you want to be loved, giving to others what you want to receive, that way leads to life for us all. This belief that the life and light of Christ runs through everyone and everything, everything poses a huge threat to the forces of empire. You cannot oppress others and you cannot exploit creation with this conviction at your core. John Philip Newell tells the story of a time that he spoke at a Celtic Christianity talk in Ottawa where an elder of the Mohawk tribe had been invited to comment on the connection between indigenous and Celtic wisdom. So Newell began his talk saying that Celtic tradition invites us to seek the light of Christ in each other and in everything that has been. When Newell finished his talk, the Mohican approached him with tears in his eyes and said, as I've been listening to these themes, I have been wondering where I would be tonight. I have been wondering where my people would be tonight. And I've been wondering where we would be as a Western world tonight if the mission that had come to us from Europe centuries ago had come expecting to find light in us. The missionaries who came to the New World didn't come looking for the light of Christ in the people they encountered. So they colluded with the forces of colonialism to devastating effect. The Pharisees and the legal experts couldn't see the light of Christ in the woman they brought to Jesus because they were steeped in religious and patriarchal rules that enabled them to treat her in ways they would never want to be treated themselves. They couldn't see how they were opposed to God's will and God's way until the life and the light of Christ set them free. And that's where I find the best news in our text today. Christ comes to set us free from the values and the behaviors that keep everyone and everything thriving, us and the whole world. May we remember what the world wants us to forget. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, beloved creatures held together in and by the light and the life of the cosmic Christ. We've been set free to set others free without judgment and without fear, but with courage and compassion. Christ in you, Christ in me, 
of Christ throughout all of creation. Remember. Amen. Part of what it means to be the church is rejoicing with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep. So as we enter into this time of prayer, I invite you to write any prayer requests you'd like to share on the cards in your pews and just pass them to the center. Um, We'll collect those and read those aloud as part of our prayer together. Let us go before God in prayer. For wisdom from someone I discounted, and for warm days in February, and for the right song on the radio, and for the very existence of dancing. Thank you, God. For laughter that dares to bubble through tears, and unclenched fists making room for someone's hand in mine. Thank you, God, for kind words when all I heard inside my own head was condemnation, and for the fact that grace surprises me every single time, even though it always comes around again. Thank you, God. As we breathe in this moment and as grace floods our lungs, Thank you. Gather up our gratitude and transform us through it, that we, like you, might become 
gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Hear now the prayers of our community. We pray for Libby, who burned her hand severely trying to put out a fire on the stove. For Josh, age 18, diagnosed with leukemia. For good health for myself, family, and community. Prayers with, for, the, for people in the Middle East and Ukraine and in our nation. And for those who don't have a supporting, loving family to lean on. And now we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Jesus didn't exactly use these words, but his ministry and his life show us that where we invest our love, we invest our life. There are so many things that pull at our time and our attention and our resources, so many voices that call to us. So in this time of worship, I invite you to consider who you want to be. Where do you want to invest your love? Where do you want to offer your life? Let us offer our gifts unto the Lord.
Let us pray. Redeemer, protector, giver of mercy, may these gifts become a shield wherever stones are hurled. May they be for us a gesture of welcome that banishes the scornful gaze. May they transform into a healing balm whenever old wounds cause fresh pain. May they point us toward compassion in places where judgment looms large. May they empower the despised and lift up the lowly. May these good gifts rewrite our stories, and may they lead us into life. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. the light and life of Christ flows and shines. As you go out into the world and all of its forces that seek to oppress, to exploit, to confuse, and all of those pressures that inevitably come your way, remember you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You're beloved. The light 
and life of Christ shines in and through you. And Christ has conquered those forces. That light of Christ cannot be overcome by the darkness. Take heart as you go out into the world to join God's Spirit in manifesting heaven here on earth. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Thank you.